electronic magazine attachment on their email. I had one email from a member who said they got the email but there was no attachment on it, which was very odd because I sent the same one to all the members and, and everybody else, nobody else has complained about it. So somehow it disappeared from one person's incoming email. So I sent her another copy, so that was, that was all right. Outbox, inbox. Yep, that worked. So I don't know what the problem was. Mm, I've, the account, I've had that account since the last main meeting, at least. So. Yeah, I mm. But I don't, it's not an address I'm advertising anywhere. So it's, um, President at Wellmac is working has gone through many permutations in the last three days while they move everything, and move everything again. And, uh, but it's all working at the moment, as far as I can tell. Okay. So if there's no questions on that, um, I will go to. Q&A stuff. Margaret, you had some questions and I might just get your ones out of the way first because you might, might need to leave early. Yep. Um, so, you had a question about how to stop iTunes from reorganising your recordings after updates and I assume you mean an iTunes application update. Uh, yes, yeah. So, it's removed your music assignments from a folder. Now, what exactly do you mean by a folder is the problem? Um, are you talking about a playlist in iTunes or something else? Because the, the Right, OK. Um, but I don't want to lose them. No. The problem is likely to be for things like recordings. They don't actually have any identifiable metadata attached to them. If you have a look at a typical... Yeah, yep. And iTunes, by default, organises its music library automatically, and if you've got things in there which haven't got the right information on them, iTunes might randomly reorganise them when they change their mind on how things will get organised. So... Mm. Right, so the, the key thing is to actually have, if you, if you want things to be grouped together, what you need to do is find the track in iTunes, use the get info command and make sure you've got something sensible in artist and album and then preferably the track number because that will actually tell iTunes these things belong together. If you have unknown artist, unknown album, it will randomly re reorganise them as it sees fit. So you really... Once you've actually imported it into iTunes, just make sure that they have correct, have something sensible. It doesn't have to be the real thing. It's got to be unique. And it, it basically organises things by artist, then by album, and then by track within the album. So if you can mimic that behaviour, then it's, it's not going to be a problem. Nearly everything in my, my library is just um, commercial music, so I don't think I've actually got um, much in the way of unknown, because I've, nearly everything I've got is either bought from iTunes Store or... Um, uh, no, unknown playlist. I don't know if you'd have anything obvious there. If I sort by, where's the browser? Column browser. And then drag that down. No, not that. Give me that one. That one. There we go. I come down here, that'll be faster. Unknown, oh, various artists. Yeah, I haven't even got a section there for unknown artist. So I've named everything to make sure that nothing gets mislaid. So the ver that there are a few random tracks I've ended up accumulating over the years, which were stuff that I haven't managed to find a copy of anywhere else, that sort of thing, because normally I go and buy something if I want it. But if I'm, I think it might be one or two tracks that I've somebody's, somebody else had and I just haven't been able to find it. So um, until I find it, I might leave a copy in here. So, um, but even stuff like my grandfather's classical music I've, uh, has all been labelled correctly, so it doesn't um, get lost. Um, Yep, some of, it, some of which we used it as funerals, so I haven't deleted it yet, so I can replay the funeral <laughs> playlist <laughs> when I feel like it. Which one? Sorry, this you're talking about this thing here. No, the one before that. Where you... Turn off that column browser again. So that's my normal view. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm looking at this is how I normally look at my music library in iTunes. I'm looking at it by song rather than by album. That's the album view, which gives you all the covers. I've also gone to the trouble of getting pictures for all my albums, so um, or nearly all of them. There's a few strange ones that I don't have. So I've got 
apart from the ones that are bought from iTunes, which get them automatically, but all the ones I've, I've imported myself, I've actually gone to the trouble of finding either the, the exact same picture on the internet or I've... Um, I don't think I actually bother scanning any because I was able to find a copy of it on the internet or something which was close enough that it was okay. Um, some of them aren't actually... That's not actually the cover on that little river, river band album, but it's enough. It's close enough that it's identifiable. So, um, And so there's, there's an artist's view and an album's view and a song's view, all of which are showing you the same things, just in more detail. Um, because when you were in that day, yep. did you have a pick on the uh, oh yeah, well, I just you were talking about possibly this thing. Yeah, yeah. That's the get info command. I just use command I to bring that up. Um, so it's under file, I think. No, under song. No, I don't know where the, don't know where it's hiding. I'm just so used to using the keyboard shortcut that it's, <laughs> I have no idea where they've hidden it. Um, yeah, it is song info under the edit menu, just to be different. So that just brings up the detailed information about this track, showing you the artwork, the lyrics if you've got them. Options, so sorting rules. Yeah, yeah. So if you alter the details, if you alter the details, there it modifies the information attached to that particular yeah, file, correct. and also iTunes keeps it in its index, so it's using it to index them all. Um, it's also worth noting that if you've got these sort as things, you can actually use that to override the displayed values and use something else instead. So occasionally I've used that. Also, it's worth noting the difference between artist and album artist. Some compilation discs, for example, it might be, um, for example, Queen music, but performed by all these different people, and you want the artist for the individual track, but you want the album artist to be Queen, so that the album artist is the one that overrides the um, sorting rule for individual albums, so artists. So um, I have to find... There's one, Aerosmith. So there's an Aerosmith album with... Some of them have got uh, compilations of other people. So that in those cases, they will have album artist is Aerosmith and artist is Aerosmith and Run DMC, for example. So that, that means it's grouped together as part of the Aerosmith album, not creating a separate album. Hmm. OK, so unless there's any more, more questions about iTunes, I think we'll move on to another one. Uh, now, Margaret, your second question was also related to iTunes. You have... Updated your Apple ID to Gmail, but iTunes insists on you continuing to log in with your old um, email address, and so your Apple ID linked to your previous email address. This is one of the things that I've dealt with when I've been helping people individually. When I've gotten to change their Apple IDs, you basically have to sign out on, of everything. And in iTunes, under the account menu, you'll see at the top, it gives you your name and your Apple ID in grey, that's one that's currently signed in as. And if you've changed your Apple ID using the official method, so your email address is effectively look, looks different in your Apple ID, you have to choose the sign out command, that one there. And then after, after you've signed out, you then sign in again immediately using your new Apple ID and password. If you don't do that... No, that's fine. That, that one's the, le the least troublesome version of it. The most troublesome version of that is if you are... If you haven't changed your Apple, you haven't signed out of iCloud before changing your Apple ID, because that's the one that links a whole bunch of synchronization stuff to the computer. So that's the important one you need to sign out before changing your Apple ID. So in iTunes, it's just sign out, and then the same command says sign in again. Um, and there's a corresponding one in App Store, except this time it's the store menu, and this time it's um, down the bottom, sign out and it shows you your account name down the bottom. So again, that would need to be, if that was saying your old Apple ID, you'd need to sign out and then sign in again using your new Apple ID. Yes, that's possibly a bit confusing because if I go to... Under account, yep. Even if you do go into, um, in, in certain cases, iTunes will insist on you signing in again, even if you're already signed in. It needs an extra entry of your, password, of your Apple ID password of verification. So, like, App Store does the same thing if you want to look at your purchase list. So, if that is actually showing the wrong Apple ID, it probably means you are currently signed in using 
still signed in using the old Apple ID, because normally it would be blank if it's not signed in at all. But if it is signed in and doesn't use your password again, it would show you the wrong Apple ID there. So that's a clue. Okay. Is that the same procedure apply to iBooks as well? Yes. iTunes, App Store, iBooks, potentially FaceTime and iMessage as well. All of them and iCloud. <laughs> Basically, there's six different things minimum if you've used all the Apple services that you have to sign out from and sign back in if you change your Apple ID. It's a pain in the neck. It's easier on an iPhone because it usually auto switches, but it doesn't do all of them for you. It does some of them. <laughs> uh, iCloud and system preferences. Apple, uh, App Store. iTunes. iBooks, if you're signed into the iBooks store. FaceTime, if you've used FaceTime on your computer, to sign in using your Apple ID, and iMessage, which is the Messages application on the Mac. You may have to go into the accounts. It's a bit harder to find in that case. And if you have more than one device, you do this on every single device. You've got to sign out of, every, of your old Apple ID on everything, on every service on everything, and then sign in again for every service on everything using a new Apple ID. It's a pain in the neck. The only slight mitigation on iOS devices is normally your iTunes store, app store, and iBook store sign in with the same credentials. So it's one thing to do rather than three things <laughs> on that one device. So, um, yeah, it's just more trouble than it's worth, usually. So that was question two. Question three is one we may not be able to answer. Um, your internet speed has become slower than dial-up, and your email accounts keep cutting out and back in again. You seem to have to turn off Wi-Fi off and on again rather, than, uh, rather a lot to revive the connection. Have any other Vodafone users had this problem, or is it something wrong with your computer? Is that yep. And I phoned them up, and about 10 minutes later it was all back to normal. Right. Now, I have also had that problem on one or two occasions where everything was just going completely do -lally. The only thing I did to try and fix it was I switched off my cable modem for half an hour and switched it back on again. And that fixed it. Not necessarily, because that's not the problem area. You may have just got, it may have been random bad luck with what's going on on the internet. Um, but I have had random problems on Vodafone's cable network a couple of times where the internet basically was mostly not working, or very, very slow, and the only solution, I, th I figured there was a fault up upstream somewhere, because I was able to establish that I couldn't talk to anything reliably. I, I, their official advice is, before you ring us, turn your cable modem off for half an hour and turn it back on again and see if that fixes it. And on both occasions, it has fixed it. <laughs> so it's, that means it's the outside connection, not your internal Wi-Fi as such. So you may have just got bad luck. So they reset. Right, but you need to first of all try your end just to make, eliminate that as a factor. If it still doesn't work after you've done that, then you ring Vodafone and wait in the interminable queue for them to actually talk to you. <laughs> well, you got lucky then because that's um, the, the, it's been horrendous when I've, when I've tried. When I was down to about, I think it was eight megs actual download and nine hundred megabytes of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So terrible. Yep. Okay, so that was all of Margaret's questions. So apart from r ran random luck, it's very hard to predict that. Help, right? Yep. Now, Dennis, you had a question. Uh, that was to do with at least one. Um, Yahoo taking over a Google search engine was the previous problem you'd had, which was I think you got some advertising stuff accidentally added to your web browser. That, that has been solved. Yep. Right, so the mouse didn't work and it was frozen oh, on the yes. screen when you woke up the computer. Yes, I leave it on all over 24-7 and usually in the morning I go in and have a quick look at headlines and so forth, which I do, and then put it back to sleep. Yeah. I had breakfast, came back, and I couldn't have No, well that's just random misbehaviour of the operating system is the most likely explanation. I believe... Uh, Many people have been grumbling about that as, an, as a bug in Sierra, that some, some computers have a tendency to just not wake up reliably after going to sleep. And if that happens, the only solution usually is to force to turn off the computer and turn it back on again. Um, I had to turn the power off. I couldn't even get yep. to the, turn it off. Right. Well, 
rather than turning your power off, the next, the next closest thing is you hold down the power button for at least five seconds, and that forces the computer to switch off abruptly. So it's equivalent to turning the power off without actually physically turning the power off. Um, and then you just let go and then push it normally and it, and it wakes up, it all starts up from scratch. And will then tell you, you didn't shut your computer down properly, do you want to report this to Apple or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I haven't seen it much myself. I think I have a feeling it's more a problem with computers with hard drives rather than solid state drives or iMacs perhaps or something. Yeah, mine did it twice. All right. And then uh, after sending it to Apple, uh, the next upgrade I've had no problem. Right, because it, it's the sort of thing they might have fixed in a, even in one of the security updates if there's a bug in, that they've fixed as a side effect of a security fix or something like that. But generally speaking, if there's a still significant bugs in Sierra as of 10.12.6, the only way to fix them is to upgrade to 10.13 and, and potential problems that brings in. All right, so well that's that's potentially the same problem, but um, um, yeah. Okay. Right, so that was that question. And I don't think I had any other... Oh, that was the CD drive, yeah, which was misbehaving, and I, I didn't really have any further input on that. It was just basically, what's the, the, to summarise for other people, it was you were inserting CDs or DVDs into your external optical drive, and they didn't show up on the desktop. Correct. Yeah. And what sort of remedies did you try before emailing me? Did like, for example, did you try unplugging the optical drive even though it had a disk in it and plugging it back in again, um, restarting the computer? The, the, the key thing was to get disk utility open and then the disk utility was the disk that was in there. Ah, that's a clue. If disk utility doesn't show any disks, that means it's stuck. The, the entire file system is stuck trying to do something and it hasn't finished yet. And it's probably um, something like it's attempting to mount a disk and it's still trying and it's still trying and it's still trying and it hasn't actually finished trying yet. So um, that's, that's a common problem with one advantage of switching to the new operating system and if you've got a solid state drive, the new file system that's in High Sierra no longer has system-wide getting stuck problems, which, high, which the old file system did have. So um, I'm wanting to upgrade the new operating system, but as per I've mentioned in the magazine, I can't yet because the membership database that Shane and I use is still stuck on an old version of FileMaker that doesn't work. So, yeah, that could just be it was trying to it was trying and trying and trying and not succeeding. So it's very hard to diagnose that sort of problem without knowing the underlying issue. Um, and yeah, I suggested various things. I was thinking of suggesting things like looking in if you're looking about this Mac system report. So that brings up system information. This has actually got a section here to see whether there is actually a recognised optical drive plugged into your computer. Um, so that's a useful clue. And here's one I brought with me, so you can see what it looks like. So here is my external cheap and nasty optical drive, the old G-branded one. If I plug that in and it wakes up, this doesn't auto-refresh the screen though, so you've got to actually tell it explicitly to refresh, which is Command R as the keyboard shortcut, and still hasn't found it. Does it show up? USB. No. Hmm. There you go, there's a mystery. It's not actually showing up at all. If I couldn't run that again... No, it hasn't spotted it. I wonder why. No, it won't show. It's not, if it's not showing up there, then it, it, the computer doesn't even know it's plugged in. So nothing, certainly Finder wouldn't know about it. Shouldn't you use the other plug? No. Oh, yes, that would help. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, it just it automatically went for the closest plug. Wrong plug. <laughs> That's the one that has the data on it. That one's only got power, <laughs> and I don't need it, so um, I just haven't bothered in the cable. So thank you, Rex. That was exactly the problem. <laughs> <laughs>
And now if I refresh the view, we get, there you go, MTU 1807. So it shows up under USB as a MediaTek device with not much useful information. But if I go to disk burning, it shows it now as a recognised optical drive. So, um, and then, if I, as it says there, if I want to see the speed of it, I plug a disk in and it will tell me what it can do in more detail. So, um, yep, so that's a useful trick. And if I unplug it, you'd notice that doesn't update automatically. If I now refresh it, it says nothing there. So if you if you ch thought to check that or knew to check that, that would at least tell you, does my computer know that the driver's there? So that, that's a starting point. Um, but it, I was going to suggest looking at that, but then I realised, well, actually, it doesn't make any difference. You, that, that narrows the problem down to one of two areas. Either the driver isn't recognised or the disk, disk, disk isn't recognised, but it doesn't help you solve the problem. So there <laughs> wasn't much point telling you about it, but it's just a piece of potentially useful diagnostic aid anyway. And the same goes for anything else that doesn't seem to be working plugged in via USB. If you can't see it appearing and disappearing on this list of USB devices when you refresh the view, then that means it's not actually recognised as being plugged in. Um, okay. Thank you. Right. The other thing that happened, I had in the last few days as well, I put a, an action through Photoshop that showed the files the same size and renumbered them so forth. Yep. So they weren't JPEGs or or something now. But they didn't say they were JPEGs. I mean, they didn't say they were. It's just that file number. So I'm beginning to think of all these things. What's going on if I can get it? Well, that's a different problem. That's probably something getting mixed up with the file name and using the wrong wrong convention or something like that. I don't know. I should have checked it before I took it off. Okay, so I'll just open the floor to any, any other questions that people have. Graham? Okay, that's running. All oh, right. Yep, okay. So not on the Wi Fi, but we have actually got the streaming going it appears at the moment so um, yep um, incidentally for those one thing I hadn't had time to do was sort of explain to people the difference between running IMAP and POP I found this is a useful trick for dealing with an IMAP account because it tends to split things across multiple mailboxes if you're using IMAP and you're used to the way that everything comes in via the inbox and POP but they can be scattered on IMAP um, if you have a look at my Zoho account, for example, it's got a mechanism which automatically splits off things it regards as a newsletter or notification into these other folders. So if I only look at my inbox, I'll never see those messages. And also for anybody who's migrated from Vodafone, um, if you have the news server auto-detecting things and thinking they're spam, they'll jump straight into the junk folder without you actually doing anything. And if you're only looking at the inbox, you won't see the spam folder unless you go and deliberately look for it. A useful trick I've found is to create a smart mailbox which I call recent and the settings I use on that one uh, edit smart mailbox is date received is in the last and you choose how many days you actually want so if any email anywhere on my computer not including junk is included in that list so any email I've received in the last now three days I've just bumped it up from two days shows up in that list I, however, however, have deliberately excluded one particular folder that was full of a lot, bunch of rubbish that I didn't want to see because there were, there were hundreds and hundreds of messages that somebody had sent via the online form to join the club. Um, so I had excluded that, but now it's not relevant, so I can get rid of that. So I just call it recent, and it, the critical one is that first rule. Date received is in the last however many days, and that shows you messages no matter where you've put them, and no matter which account they're in, and no matter which mailbox they've been auto-sorted into or rules have moved them or whatever it might be. Um, to create that, you go into Mailbox, New Smart Mailbox, and in there you specify, give it a sensible name, that's just for your reference, contains messages that match 
and then you choose this, the category and I just used date received is this week and last week is exactly is in the last is the best option and you specify not years otherwise you get an awful lot of them choose days and pick an appropriate number of days that you want to sort of things you may not have dealt with but they may have gone somewhere funny it's useful just to see them all in one place and I tend to have my recent view is the one I normally look at so now I'd, I'd, if there's anything I haven't dealt with and within three days I try to flag messages to make sure I don't lose track of them so I can go back and look at the flagged folder which is what I was looking at before so that's showing all the ones I've actually marked with a flag so I can find them um, again No, because that doesn't show the smart mail box with that rule does not include junk mail. You have to, if you want it to include junk mail, there's an extra rule for that. Um, date received is in the last. I'll just change that one. Hmm. Actually, I don't see an option there for is in the junk folder. I think you may have to, you can probably do it by explicitly including that folder though. I haven't actually gone hunting for it because normally I just I just keep an eye on my junk folder. Um, I'm doing it. Yep. When you were doing that, I thought that you found a way of getting around So typically, what I do is I've actually made sure that everything in my junk folder is marked as red. So if I get any new junk, it immediately shows up next to junk as a number and a, and a banner there so I can tell there's something new. I just need to check to make sure it's not a, not a false positive. Um, so all I, all I do is, I haven't, haven't bothered going and deleting all my old junk, because I, I, what I tend to do is go through and look at them occasionally just to make sure there's no old false positives, but what I'll eventually do is go through and delete them all. Um, like that one wasn't junk, but it got left in there by mistake, so um, I didn't bother fixing it. If it's just advertising stuff, I don't particularly care if it's been misclassified. Um, but everything on that screen really is junk. <laughs> and not, none of that I wanted. So, um, yeah. So, just being able to see the... And you ignore the fact that I've got 24,000 unread messages. That's just mailing lists that have a lot of lot of email that I only read selected ones off. So that's why there's so many. And I'm in the process of sorting out all my e email accounts. That one I haven't finished sorting yet. So I've still got 1,500 messages to sort through. <laughs> Does that make sense? So just having a smart mailbox called Recent. And I've also got ones that pick out particular messages for that are wherever I put them that match certain rules, which are quite handy. So the key thing to remember about smart mailboxes, they're effectively a search. They're not a place to store things. So they will find messages that are anywhere else in mail. They don't, you don't drag things into them. They just auto-find things according to rules. It's like doing a search and then saving the search results. Um, same concept applies to smart folders and finder. Smart albums in iTunes, smart playlists, sorry, in iTunes, smart albums in photos and iPhoto. They're all the same concept, they're all just searches that let you find things wherever they might be. Okay, any other questions? Rex? David, in the latest upgrade, um, it seems to have changed the photo program. Yes. Um, and the photos You're talking about the photos application in High Sierra? Yes. Yep. Um, Try to edit a photo, it's got various controls down the side, which of course the other had similar. But these are different, and I can't seem to make some of them work. Because right. Nothing happens. I haven't had a decent play with them yet. Now, is this a case? It is, this isn't a case where they're, they're semi invisible, because some people have been complaining about not being able to see the actual editing controls, and it, you have to know where they are to click on them. And that particular problem is caused by turning on high contrast, which actually totally destroys the readability of some of Apple's standard applications user interfaces. So if it's not that problem, um, I don't have any experience myself yet with High Sierra Photos, so I can't comment on particular items. I do know they've added an ability to edit photos using external applications that support that mechanism, and I've had a brief play with that. I think Pixelmator is an example of one that can, can basically take a photo directly out of photos, edit it, and then save it back into the photos library. Um, older applications can't because they need to be updated to support the new mechanism. So, for example, a Photoshop version from several years ago wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but the normal editing features, I don't know, without having a play with it, I'd have to go and have a look. So don't have time for that right now, though. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else tried photos in High Sierra? Yeah, seems fun. Yep, for editing stuff. Mm. Mm. <coughs> well, 
Maybe you should get, <laughs> to get together. You have, you have to live near each other, which makes it easy. See if you can work out what's going on. <laughs> yes. Right. So printing mostly works okay, but not business cards. And I used to be able to print them, uh, but I have not touched them for a few years, and now when I'm going to print them, uh, printing it, it's, it's blank on the, on the screen, and uh, so I can't print them. Okay, that could be tricky to, to diagnose, unfortunately. It could be a case of the particular software you're using to do the business cards or the page layout, there's, there's too many variables, unfortunately, without having an idea of which... Have I tried a different uh, type of uh, business card or set up uh, to different type of business card? And I tried one and I tried another. None of the business cards can be printed. Right. Do you know which application you're using to try and print those? They are set in different words. Word. Okay. All right. And not one that I normally use. So... Um, do you know which version of Word? Uh, no. That's 2011. I got my computer. Oh, we'll probably have time to do it before the meeting, before the main topic, unfortunately. But um, I don't actually know, even know how you do business cards in, in Word. Um, cards, business cards, here we go. Right there. Basic business card. That sort of thing. So... Well, it's even picked up. That's frightening. <laughs> Where did I get them from? <laughs> okay, so if I try and print that, and then, so what sort of printing style are you trying to use? You see, when I want to print them, they don't even appear on the, on, on the screen. Oh, okay. So they don't even appear on the screen. Yeah, they go away office. I don't want to know about that. Um, pages per sheet one. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to play with, play around with it, unfortunately, because there's so many different options floating around in here. All pages, odd pages, even pages. Um, copies and pages. So if you don't see a preview there... Yeah, I don't see the preview. And it's not just a quick... Well, that's obvious. Quick preview is turned off, so that's, that's, that's self-explanatory. But it will depend heavily on which version of Office you're using. Uh, so this is Office 2011. Um, if I do the same thing, do I still have... Word 2008, I do <laughs> installed. I haven't deleted it yet. Um, and I go new from project gallery and go to business cards and no, that'll do. Light business card. What does that do? Crashes on me, perhaps? No, there we go. Like this one here, you have, uh, I tried to print that and uh, it doesn't have the on the, on hmm. Yeah, well, that's right. So I don't have Office 2016, so I can't tell what they've done on that version. Well, the version the version of Office might affect it because it may behave differently, and it may depend on the version you're running and the operating system version you're running, and whether they're compatible with each other um, as well. So there's too many variables without to diagnose, unfortunately, without sort of seeing all the details, and probably don't have time for that right now. But if we have time during supper or something, I might be able to have a quick look then and see if we can narrow it down. That's probably if you've brought the computer with you. Right, quote that. I don't want Word running. I don't want that Word running either. Death to Microsoft Word. I don't use it normally. It just takes forever to do yeah, and, and once I upgrade to High Sierra, I'm going to, I don't know, I might delete it completely or move it somewhere off my main system because it's, it's no longer support and I don't want to pay Microsoft through the nose of something I use once a year. <laughs> it's rid ridiculous. Um, okay, uh, we'll have to call, uh, cut this question session short. So I'll do one, one more question. Robin? Is it okay? Uh, as, lo as per my notion of the magazine, basically it depends on what software you're running. If you've got third-party software that's not compatible, if you're just dealing with pretty much bog-standard Apple stuff, it should be fine. Um, if you are running a variety of... Re I've got like hundreds and hundreds of applications of which I u actively use about 50 of them. Um, and of those, two, as I've mentioned, are critical, and both of those don't work properly. So, I've got, I've got an Right. Sierra, you need the latest 
Yes, that's the sort of thing where I'm aware that some people have, have been complaining about. So um, I'm not sure whether the latest version is 2017. Probably is, yep. Yeah. Um, if I go to... I don't know if I can still find it. It's actually forums.macrumors.com. See, and I, I had the link for it in the previous magazine. And um, but the other one was uh, Roaring Apps. That one's easy to remember. Roaringapps.com. And if we search for AutoCAD and see what other people have said about it. Doesn't actually. That hasn't got. Nobody basically has reported any details about it. So if we have a look at what's called an auto card, <laughs> auto card. Yeah, doesn't. Well, okay. So that's interesting. Autodesk 2017 apparently doesn't work according to somebody. Um, there's no information about AutoCAD 2016. Um, to keep talking AutoCAD. I'm thinking, I'm thinking HyperCAD or something like that. Uh, if I go back to AutoCAD 2015. But that isn't the same thing as AutoCAD actually, No. Oh, LT, yeah. It's AutoCAD LT. They, they have, nobody's even mentioned it. So the problem with these things is if nobody else actually bothers to I, I tell us. The, the hmm. Yeah, but that, that's AutoCAD should tell you exactly which version is officially supporting it. So just using the one I'm familiar with, which was FileMaker, FileMaker 16 officially supports High Sierra. To 15, they had, they made a minor change to support it. 14 doesn't, but seems to work. 13 and earlier definitely do not work. They crash at random. So same sort of problem could have happened um, with other things. Well, does it matter? If As long as the application is compatible with the existing operating system that you're running, my if it, if it requires the new AutoCAD should work in Sierra because they wouldn't require High Sierra straight away. I wouldn't think that would be likely. Normally, no, they required it the other way around. High Sierra requires. Yes, that's right. So if the application still works on the older operating system, you're best off upgrading all your applications first before you upgrade the operating system so you're already running the right version for the new OS. That's the way, generally I keep installing updates for everything and when new versions get announced I buy them so I've got everything up to date unless it's something I'm not using anymore in which case I just abandon it. Um, and things like pages, numbers, keynote, I'm sort of just hanging on for dear life on the old versions because the new versions just are in too much of a pain still. But they've at least fixed some of the bugs in the latest updates so um, they might be good enough again now. But they were the previous one there was a serious bug in numbers for example. Um, if you had any formula including a currency item, the end result was currency even if you were doing um, something like counting them or something like that. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, our, we had some rather peculiar looking uh, membership uh, treasurer's reports because <laughs> they had currencies and number of members counts and things like that which didn't make any sense. <laughs> well, it was, it was only one minor version. The previous minor version before the latest update for numbers four, if they're up to now, had, had a bug and it got fixed again in the very latest update. Yeah, you may not have noticed if you didn't use the right sort of... Um, there was another website, I'm tr I can't remember the exact location, it's... Uh, um, I might be able to find it, so site colon macrumors.com um, works, does not work. It was a forum. There it is, yep, that was how I found it last time. <laughs> so this is a thread that people have contributed to on Mac Rumors listing applications yeah, that people have tried. Yep, so that one, Autodesk Fusion is the only Autodesk related thing that's been mentioned in that list. Um, does not work. Autodesk AutoCAD 2017, that's the latest version, does not work. That's the full oh, so version. I need 18 probably, or an update to... See, this could be out of date, and you have to take all these things with grains of salt because it depends on... It may be a problem on a particular configuration and not for everybody, or it might work at random for the person who claims it works and not work for other people, and it's always... The only way to be sure, as I recommended in the magazine, is to actually... If you're not if you're not sure because it's, it's still, still relatively early days, is you actually need to 
do a test install the new operating system. And the easiest way to do that is to actually clone your entire computer onto another hard drive and boot from that. Because then you don't have to risk wiping your main one and reversing back to the old system if everything's seriously broken. Um, yep. Not with Time Machine. You'd have to uh, use, if you use Super Duper or Carbon Copy Cloner to clone your drive to another drive, then you can boot from that and test it. So, so if I haven't done that, can I ever boot it up again? Sorry, if you... If thing crashes, then I want to... Oh yes, Time Machine is bootable for the purposes of recovering your drive. You just can't boot into a normal operating system and run things from it. It's a recover-only mechanism. Yeah, I don't think I need yeah, and if necessary, you can download off the internet to get what it needs to recover from your time machine drive and things like that. So that's not a problem. It's just if you want to do a, a completely bootable external drive, then you can't use time machine for that purpose. Yeah, OK. Right, I will stop there <laughs> on Q&A, and we'll start talking about cloud services. Um, in order to do this tidily, what I was going to do was use Keynote, the old version, and start creating a presentation, which I was hoping to at least get a skeleton for. We don't want that one. Let's go create a new one. Right. Well, I, w I would like to finish this in about 40 minutes, so it's going to be a relatively short one, so a bit before 9 o'clock will be my target. So... Um, so this is cloud services, and I'll just save that now so I don't forget what I'm doing with it. Uh, put that in the right folder. We'll make meeting presentations, not that one. Meeting presentations is usually where it is. Right, I don't want that. I clicked on the wrong thing, so let's pick the name up. So, cloud services. So, I'll just use this to keep notes. I'll turn this into a, a better um, presentation as we go. So, um, just with any notes on things. So, the, um, the sorts of things we wanted to cover from my capital Apple were what are some options for. And the, thought, the tasks I was listing were syncing. So we've got syncing files. I'll leave that as a separate item. So we're going to do syncing. Ah, oh, that's the wrong one. I want to go that way. Um, syncing contacts, calendars, etc. Uh, as well as photos. So general syncing services is sort of the first the first category I was talking about of videos. Um, that was syncing you between your own devices I'm referring to there. And then we've got sharing as the next general category. So you've got sharing files, um, sharing photos and videos. So that's you what you've created something you want to make it available to other people, whether that might be other people viewing it only or being able to um, potentially modify it themselves. But then as a sort of a third level of that, you can go into collaborative editing, which I sort of want to classify separately. So those are sort of the main topics I wanted to, to sort of touch on. Um, anything that anybody else thought was a, a useful thing to know about? Um, general, oh, there's also general file storage and online backups. That's sort of the major bits I can think of. Any, anything else that people would like to sort of have it touch on briefly with those, with general concept of things you can do with the internet um, for cloud services? Can you sync music? If you add some more music? Sync music between your devices you're thinking of. That's one we can just talk about when we get to it. So I add syncing music as a possibility. Okay, yep, all right. So if we go back to starting with syncing files. So the idea is here, you, you've got some files you want to work on which happen to be on one of your devices, 
And the whole concept between with syncing is you have more than one device. You want the same information available on all of them, or both of them, or however many there might be. Um, so syncing files generally involves one of your computers stores a copy of the file somewhere, and the other devices can then either access that online or can pull down a copy of it and have it locally on their on their own local storage as well. And ideally you want it arranged such that if you make a change on one device, it's automatically re replicated on the other device. So as soon as you go to any of your devices, the same changes have already been done on everything. So you see the latest version of the file on every device. So what are some of the services that offer that basic feature set? Any volunteers with ones that they know about, rather than me rattling them all off for you? Which ones have people actually used for that sort of functionality where you're, you're transferring files between your own devices? Sorry? Contacts. Con not, not contacts, files. General files I'm talking about, so Word documents or, or some kind of document. Dropbox. Dropbox. Dropbox is the obvious one, yes. Any others that people have used? I can add to that list iCloud Drive. I can add to that list um, Google... Drive and Microsoft's one that his name is temporarily escaping me. OneDrive. Those are the major ones. Oops. Microsoft OneDrive and also I could mention Box um, as another one, which is sort of an alternative to Dropbox aimed at business users. Um, mm, that's not really. That's more of a file sharing rather than a synchronising tool. So we'll come back to that later on. Okay. So. The basic idea between all of these services is that they operate as a web service that you can use through a web browser and upload and download files. And they also all have programs that you can install on your devices that give you direct access to what's in your online shared storage. So in the case of Dropbox, there is a Dropbox client which has an icon that looks like that. If you can see the icon on top of the screen because I use Dropbox, it's one that I've, I've used regularly. And if you install the Dropbox client, what you end up with is a folder which I happen to have on my desktop, I think, if I moved it. You yeah, know, it's in my home folder, that's right. You have a folder in your home folder normally called Dropbox, and anything you put in that folder is automatically synced to your Dropbox on, online. And any changes in the online Dropbox automatically get synced down to that folder. And if you have your Dropbox client installed on more than one computer, you make changes to anything in that folder and it automatically gets, appears on the other computer when it's accessing the internet. So it gives you a way of just having files you've stored in there and you can access them everywhere. Um, and vice versa. Sorry? And vice versa. If the other computer changes its files. Oh, exactly. It works, works both ways. You make a change anywhere and every device um, sees the changes. Um, interestingly, Dropbox is not showing me the icons correctly, but usually it shows a little icon on each file to say whether or not it's synced it. Um, they have a little tick on, on, next to the file. They might have actually got rid of that feature because it's not really <coughs> officially supported by Apple. They have to mine a hack to get it to work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's showing recent files. Seems to be a bit old. It's not very recent. I can, given that I've been making changes to Dropbox today, it doesn't seem all that recent. Um, so, yeah, I've just got a few um, random files. I don't actually tend to store anything permanently on my Dropbox. I keep copies of things on there rather than keeping the original. I have I have a probably now getting rather archaic concept, concept of I want all my important files on my computer, which I back up, and I don't rely on the cloud to actually keep master copies of anything. But over time... I'm gradually moving more and more stuff to be online, so Dropbox is one possible way of doing that. Um, so if I just have a quick example of looking at the Dropbox web interface, so you can get an idea of what that looks like. It's probably already signed in, but if not, I might need to sign in again. Wait for it. Sign in. Here we are. It's done it automatically without me. No, what on earth is that? Why are you playing me a video, you silly thing? Go away. Stop giving me a full screen video. I want to sign in. Okay, so that's the Dropbox web interface here. Yeah, no, 
but it's changed since I last looked at it. Oh goody, I don't want to show me around. Go away. I want to use it. I don't want to show me around. No, don't show me around. Just let me use it, you silly thing. I have to click on show me around. Skip, thank you. End tour. <laughs> right. <laughs> They've completely changed it since I last looked at it, but I didn't want didn't want to have to muck around with it. So um, the general, you can see there the list of folders is um, similar to what we just saw in my Dropbox folder. So you can um, access your files via the web browser. You can upload and download from here if you don't have the client software installed. Um, you can install the client software and you can transfer files easily just using Finder to copy things around or anything else. Peter? Yep. There are quite a few applications that have built-in support for Dropbox. If you sign into your Dropbox account using that application, it can synchronise directly through Dropbox as well. Yeah, they quite possibly is. There's some some things insist on you using that as the only option. No, um, Dropbox by default, you can apply for, you can get it for free. It gives you two gigabytes of online storage, so it gives you a reasonable amount of, of storage for files. Um, where is my? Yeah, I got 4.25 gigabytes of free storage because if you are a Dropbox customer and you recommend it to other people and they accept your recommendation, both of you get a bonus amount of storage. And I've done this a few times, so I've accumulated a bit of extra storage on my Dropbox. Um, so I'm up to 4.25 gigabytes. If you need a lot more than that, you can pay them for it, the privilege, which I'll, I won't go into, but there is that option. Um, no, end to it. Yeah, I don't care about that. So... That just gives you a quick idea of the basic concept of syncing things through Dropbox. That does more, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, so syncing files, generally speaking, um, is an easy thing to do with Dropbox. You just make sure they live in that Dropbox folder. And also has the ability to keep backup copies of things as well. So if you make a change to a file, you can actually go on the Dropbox web, inter web interface and get back a recent version of it. So you can undo a, an accidental change or something like that. Um, so that's worth noting. So going back to my presentation again, so Dropbox, that's fine. iCloud Drive. That is a feature that Apple added in, I think, OS 10, 10.10, or thereabouts. That's Yosemite. It's built into the Mac. Um, so if you have an iCloud account, you can basically use your iCloud storage allocation, which is by default 5 gigabytes for free, and you can pay not very much per month to get 50 gigabytes or more to get up to 2 terabytes, I think is the limit now. Um, so as long as all your devices are Apple products or machines running Windows, but not other brands like Android phones, for example, they have no way of accessing iCloud Drive, you can use, and they're all running recent operating systems, then you can use iCloud Drive in a similar sort of way to Dropbox to synchronise things. Um, you will find you have an iCloud Drive folder in your um, sidebar side bar of your Finder window, if you've got it all turned on, and any files that are saved to iCloud Drive will similarly be available on all your devices, and that automatically synchronises in a similar way to what we just saw for Dropbox. Also, many applications will use iCloud Drive as a default location for saving their documents. So, for example, TextEdit, all my untitled TextEdit documents have actually ended up in my iCloud Drive. So if I randomly use TextEdit to write notes, I can access them from any computer because I haven't bothered saving them. They just happen to be an iCloud Drive. Um, other applications, I tend, sometimes I don't end up doing the same thing. I tended to only deliberately save a few things, though, in my iCloud Drive. I'm also paying for iCloud storage, so I'm not worried about that accumulating too much stuff. Um, note that if you're using iCloud for backup of your iOS devices, that takes up a fairly large chunk of your free 5 gigabytes, possibly you may not have much space left unless you pay for it. So if you want to use document sharing type features, then you may find that another service like Dropbox it will cost you less than paying for iCloud Drive because you basically get two gigabytes for free with with Dropbox, but you don't get that much. Well, you get five gigabytes, but you might be using some of it with iCloud. Google Drive. Um, I probably have one, but I haven't used it because I have a. I'm signed into my Google account. Effectively, if you have a Google account for anything, you get all the features. So if you've got a Gmail account, for example, you'd automatically have a Google Drive storage area. Um, 
which gives you, I don't know how much storage, but I think it's shared. There we go, they give you 15 gigabytes. That's shared between your Gmail and your, um, your Google Drive and anything else you're using on Google services. So they give you a fairly large chunk of storage compared to Dropbox for free. So that's worth knowing about. And that, again, works similarly to Dropbox. You can download and install the Google Drive client software, which gives you a similar sort of shared automatically synced folder. Um, or you can just use a web interface to, to transfer files back and forth. So there is a common theme here. All of these services offer the same sort of basic functions, feature set. Mm -hmm. That's a not quite the same feature. We'll come back to that because that's a, a later feature. I'm just talking about synchronising stuff at the moment, so it's worth noting that as an option. Microsoft OneDrive is one that I haven't bothered playing with. If you have subscribed to Office 365, which is Microsoft's online version of Office and it also gives you the desktop client software, paying in perpetuity on a monthly basis or yearly basis or whatever, they include a one terabyte OneDrive online storage as part of that subscription, which is actually a very, very cheap offer if you really want to use offer, Office and you want to have some online storage as well. So it's worth knowing about that. Again, there is a client you can download and install which gives you file access directly from the desktop on your computer. Box is mostly aimed at business users. Um, its name is obviously similar to Dropbox and I haven't used it for anything serious, but a wee while ago they gave away free 50 gigabyte box accounts, so I ended up getting one, and I haven't used it for anything. So I can't tell you much about it, because I've got so many other ones, I just use the others, and I haven't needed that one. But um, I think, it, I don't remember what their normal free allocation is, it's probably similar to Dropbox, but not very big. So all of those services can do that sort of feature. Um, it's also worth noting there are probably programs you can run on your computer which auto-sync files via the internet to other computers of yours without actually storing them online somewhere. I haven't gone investigating anything like that, but there are some like that. Okay, contacts and calendars. The obvious one that most people will use already is iCloud. So if you have set up an iCloud account on your computer, you can turn on contact and calendar sync and all of your devices automatically synchronise, all of your Apple devices that is, automatically synchronise to iCloud and changes you make in one place are immediately applied everywhere else. Google is another one I know of. If you have a Gmail account, Google has contacts and calendar support. So you can synchronise your contacts and calendars via Google account rather than your iCloud account should you be so inclined. Um, I'll call it Microsoft, and it depends on what you what flavour you want to call it. But basically, it's either Outlook or Hotmail or one of those services. Basically, if you have a Microsoft Outlook.com account or some equivalent, or an Office 365 account, all of them are tied together, and they also offer contact and calendar synchronisation via that that account. Um, and ideally, if you've got more than one of these, you should pick one and stick to that one, and don't enable it for more than one of them unless you really want your contacts available in more than one place, because you can run into problems where you've got the same contact in several synchronising services, and you end up with multiple copies of the same contact in different places. So you may have some particular person's contact card synced via iCloud, and you've accidentally ended up with another copy you've synced via Google. You edit this one, and that syncs via iCloud, but you've still got the wrong one with the out-of-date information on your Google account. So it's best to pick one and stick to it. And the general pattern is if you've got all Apple devices, iCloud is the easiest option. If you have a mixture of platforms, then Google or Microsoft might be a better choice. Um, but it really depends what software you're using. The basic idea with all those, if I just use, as I'm doing, using iCloud, if I run contacts, you'll find that you have a title in the leftmost column in contacts for your um, the service that you're syncing, uh, syncing through, and all of your contacts will appear and all your groups will appear underneath that as well. But if you've got more than one of them, you'll have multiple headings appearing under here. So I've only got iCloud, but I might have um, Google and a few other ones down there if I'd enabled those ones as well. Um, you can also have iCloud plus On My Mac. And anything which is under the On My Mac heading is not synchronised anywhere. So you may end up with a mixture of that if you've done a slightly unusual order of setting these things up. Um, normally if you turn on iCloud contact sync, it moves everything from on my Mac to iCloud, but sometimes if you turn it on later it doesn't do that and you end up with two separate lists. 
So usually the way to fix that is to drag your contacts so they're all around, all in the right place. So you can, for example, I can't actually easily create one to demonstrate it because it's very hard to get back to that state. But if you can imagine this wasn't on my Mac um, account, I could pick up this list of people, select all on that list, and then drag them into a different list on here, and that would, and you can do that from one account to another just using drag and drop. That's the easiest way to fix that. Um, the idea with the contact sync is that make a change in one place, as with the file method, it just automatically syncs to iCloud and or whichever service you're using, and again appears on your other devices when they next update. And one problem people can run into with that is if some devices are set to sync and other ones are not, you can end up with, you change it on one device and it doesn't actually change on the other device, you then have to work out which one is not syncing to iCloud. So if you go into System Preferences and have a look in iCloud and confirm that you have, first of all you're using the same Apple ID on both devices and also both of them have contacts turned on. If one of them has and one of them hasn't, then the one that hasn't is not syncing to iCloud. The other thing, other thing that's worth noting there is that if you go to the iCloud.com website from your computer, you can actually access most of the stuff online. Um, is this going to let me log in or do I need to... Not that one. It's handy, I don't need to show you my password. <laughs> remembered it. Yes, I have two-factor authentication turned on, so I need to approve. I'll go allow. There is my code I've got to type in, 239563. That's the two-factor authentication. Yes, trust this browser, so it doesn't ask me again. System, which iCloud, Apple IDs generally, but also iCloud supports, um, which allows you to confirm that it's you doing it, because you have to physically have access to one of your devices to confirm that it's you. But once you get into the iCloud website, you'll see you can access mail, contacts, calendar, and all these sorts of things. So if I go into contacts, you'll see there is actually a web access to all the contacts from my computer. And if you're having trouble synchronising, a useful trick is to look at the list on one of your devices, go to the iCloud website and see which device does it match. If it matches one of them but not the other one, you know which one's having problems syncing. <laughs> that makes sense? Okay, I'll leave that open because we're going to need to use it again. Uh, no, not that. Let's go back. iCloud. That's it. I'll come back to that. Okay, so calendars. I won't go through it again, but basically exactly what we've just seen, calendars works the same way. If you've got calendar syncing enabled, you have in a similar fashion an iCloud or whichever service it is, exactly the same services support the same features, um, and all of those calendars are synced through my iCloud account. And again, I can go to the iCloud web interface, go into calendar and look at my calendar online if I need to. So I can access that as long as I've got um, access to the internet. So that's that's showing all my events there as well. So the web interface gives you a reasonably good access, good view of everything. Uh, where's my keynote presentation? So, and the others work pretty similarly. In Google's case there's a Google Calendar and in, they've got a Google Contacts list. The main advantage of syncing Contacts via Google is then you've got access to your contacts from your Gmail web interface, which you wouldn't do if they were just syncing via iCloud. Okay? Mm. Oh, I'm getting bleeps everywhere. Photos. Ooh, now, syncing photos and videos. iCloud Photo Library is the obvious one. Any other services that people use to sync their photos as opposed to sharing them? Anybody had an experience with other ones? I'm just trying to think of other ones. I think that Google has a mechanism for uploading all your photos to your Google Drive and syncing them to other devices, but I haven't had a good hunt for it. So I think you can do it with Google, um, and I think you can do it with some of the other services but they're mostly aimed at sharing photos or publishing them rather than sh rather than syncing them so maybe Google um, iCloud photo library is the one that I'm using and again that came in in a recent OS 10 version I think El Capitan and recent iOS versions and in order to use it you need to have paid for enough iCloud storage to fit your entire photo library online but once you've done that as with the other syncing services, you can go and look at the iCloud web interface and see your entire photo library online. So it's all there. 
um, and you can access it from photos on your Mac or from the Photos app on your computer. So all my photos will actually be available via the web interface so I can access my photo library online. Um, and when you use iCloud Photo Library, um, I'll just go into one of these as an example. Um, I was trying to test a problem with a, a technical problem with a um, cellular network near work, so I, I, I cut the screenshots and I annotated them to keep track of which was which. Um, if you have iCloud Photo Library turned on, all your devices automatically upload new photos to it and automatically download them as, as new ones appear while they're on Wi-Fi. They don't do it via cellular normally. Um, and each device can be configured to whether or not to optimise photo storage. There's an option under Photos. Is it in there or is it in Photos application? No, it's only, only in the Photos application on the Mac. Um, if you're using iCloud Photo Library, go away. No, wrong application. Try that again. That's better. Under Photos Preferences, if you have your iCloud syncing turned on, there is an option, and there's a similar one on iOS devices, whether or not you download originals or optimise storage. If you choose optimise storage, your entire photo library is available on, all, on that device, but it only keeps thumbnails, so they don't occupy a huge amount of storage. So you, if you click on the photo, it will then go and access iCloud, fetch the big version and show you the big version. So it gives you the full quality photo on demand, but it doesn't keep the full quality of photos on your computer in tying up all your storage. I prefer to have um, all my photos on my computer, so I've got them even if I'm not on the internet. So I keep my originals on my computer, I don't on my phone, so I can actually see all my photos on my phone, but I don't need 50 gigabytes of storage on my phone just to keep my photos on there. It's only using about 2 gigabytes or something like that for the thumbnails. So you can pick that for, separately for each device and it just works tidily. Apart from that, I haven't experienced other photo syncing services. That's probably the easiest one um, to think of. It's also worth mentioning the photo stream feature, which is a sort of a subset of, it, of this. iCloud Photo Library stores your entire photo library on the internet. Photo stream is used just for syncing recently taken photos. So if you, take a, if you have that turned on, you take a photo on your iPhone or your iPad, it syncs to your iCloud photo stream, and your other applications then download them when they can. So you get basically get auto-syncing of photos between your phone and your computer. And that doesn't require you storing all your photos online. It just keeps a, a recent subset of them. And interestingly, that one doesn't count towards your iCloud storage allocation. That one does. So you can do a photo stream with up to a thousand photos in it and it won't use up any of your five gigabytes. It just doesn't count. It just gets, it just, Apple provides that as a free service for syncing photos between Apple devices. Um, one thing in that general area that's worth noting, this is more sharing rather than syncing, if you use Dropbox, it has a feature where it will... Uh, Import. There it is. And some people, I've seen this do this by default. It has a feature to enable camera uploads onto your Dropbox. And what happens if you have that turned on? Anything that gets added to your photo library also gets copied to your Dropbox, including copying it to the Dropbox folder on your computer, which means if you import a photo, you end up immediately with two copies of the photo on your computer, one in your photo library and one in Dropbox, and that gets synced to your Dropbox library. And I found people using up their entire Dropbox storage by having their entire photo library haven't got synced to Dropbox and they didn't even know it was happening. It got turned on as a new feature in some version of the Dropbox software a few years ago. Um, so I, I go, if people are having problems with disk space and I notice that, I go and turn that feature on because they're almost certainly not using it. <laughs> I think the idea is that Dropbox wants to have access to your photos so that they can learn more about you possibly, but also provides a convenient way of having them online immediately to share them. But you can do that manually if you need to, so there's no particular reason for it. Okay. Right. Oh, photos go away. Right, so that was... Going back to Keynote. Syncing, photos and videos. Videos basically work through iCloud Photo Library as well, if you've got them. Music. This is a question from the floor. If you're syncing music, if you have, um, what's it called? Um, there's a particular feature that Apple had, which I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. 
so many different buzzwords that Apple's got for iTunes. If you use Apple Music, I'll mention that one first. Apple Music is basically a subscription service that gives you access to online to the entire catalogue of all the music in it. So it can stream the, all, all 20,000 songs or so that Apple's got in their library. So that's a subscription service. Um, it doesn't actually give you access to your own music, however. There is a different service that I can't remember the name of. Um, got it. iTunes Match. It's a feature that Apple offers, which you pay on an annual basis. I think it's about 25 US dollars. And what that does is it looks at the music that's in your iTunes library and says, OK, what of that list is actually available from the iTunes store? OK, you've immediately got access to all of those songs on your other devices without doing anything. Anything it doesn't recognise, it uploads a copy of the music, of your, your saved copy of the music, and then has that available to sync to your other devices. So if you pay for iTunes Match, you can actually sync your entire music library between multiple computers, even if you've imported them from CD collections. Um, I haven't done this yet. I've been intending to, but I've got too many other things going on that I haven't bothered trying it yet. But I know some people that have. So that's um, cheaper subscription. <laughs> um, Yeah, if you're talking about syncing between your devices and you don't actually need to store them on the cloud, this is really more about cloud syncing stuff. I don't know offhand of a specific cloud music sync, except probably some of the other services like Spotify and things might offer that. I haven't experimented with them. So if anybody, unless anybody happens to know that. Um, so roughly $10 a month for Apple Music, roughly $25 a year, probably US dollars in both cases for iTunes Match. So it's a fair amount cheaper. Um, and it gives you, also gives you an advantage if you ripped your CDs at low quality and iTunes Store has got a better quality copy, it will give you the better quality copy rather than what, what one you've got. So it'll up, upscale you to, um, to 256 kilobit AAC if your copy is worse than that, basically. Um, worth, worth mentioning that, but that's the usual way that most people... Do it, do it if you're syncing your library between things. Um, it's, it's just worth mentioning a way to manage that. I have in my iTunes, I've got multiple, multiple devices that I, I sync to it. I've actually set up a playlist, um, and, which I arbitrarily called iPad, and anything I put into that playlist, I've set to sync to all my devices. So if I go and have a look at my phone, uh, no, there, if, it if it's going to talk to it, and I look at the music category, I've got sync music and I've specified that only, well, only a selected list of playlists are synced. So I've, I'm picking specific things that I'm syncing, so all I need to do is add something to that playlist and next time I come along and sync my phone it'll automatically be on the phone. I don't want to sync my entire music collection because it'll take up my entire iPhone. <laughs> um, but, and then some. Um, <clears throat> and I prefer that to the manually manage music option because it means I don't need to actually go and drag and drop stuff all over the place. I just get, fiddle around on iTunes and it gets there without me doing anything else. So that, I find I prefer that. The If I go back to the summary view, the other option you've got is this manually manage music and videos thing. That completely disables syncing. You manually drag and drop things to get them onto your devices. And the only advantage of that one is you can manually drag and drop things onto your device from more than one place. So if you have multiple computers with different iTunes libraries, you can copy music onto your iPhone from, or iPad or iPod from more than one place. Which, of course, is a way of violating copyright, and you shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, so I, I, got, yeah, I bought... I don't know how much. What is my music library saying? I'll go back from there. Yeah, I've got... Nine and a half thousand songs in my iTunes library, so <laughs> 28 days if I keep playing it non stop. I've nearly got a month of music non stop, so. Hmm. Okay, sharing files. This is going to look similar. Dropbox. You can share files with other people using Dropbox. You can also do it using Google Drive. Um, now, this is one where there are lots of ways of temporarily sharing files with people. You want to give a file to somebody and then it's not going to last very long. There are a lot of services that can do that. I haven't bothered going and tracking them down because I just use Dropbox for that normally. Um, 
there is, I think, a feature in iCloud Drive to share things, but it's a little bit limited because it's a, it's a bit clunky in how it works. I generally found that Dropbox is an easier thing to deal with if you want to share stuff. And how Dropbox works, if you want to share a file with somebody, and here is an example I did earlier. Um, I opened up my Dropbox folder. Somebody needed a copy of Capital Apple, so I copied this file by option dragging it into my, I'll oh, just do it this way, Dropbox folder. So I didn't want to move it, I just wanted to have a copy of it sitting in there. And in my Dropbox folder, that file is now available and it will sync to the internet automatically. And if I click on that one and use the control key and click on it, you will find that there is a share, all these little things that have got Dropbox icons. You can share it via various methods, you can copy a Dropbox link, um, and if you use that one, it puts a string on the clipboard that you can then paste into an email message or something like that and that is a link that you can give to somebody and they can download a copy of that file as long as it stays in your Dropbox. That's a nice easy way of doing it. Um, Dropbox also has a, a little menu which doesn't seem to work properly anymore. It's supposed to... oh, I it should be in the Dropbox folder, that's why. But if I pick a file there, it gives you the same commands in there, so there's the share or copy Dropbox link and things like that. Um, so I can use that method if I just do that copy Dropbox link, and what I end up with, if I go into an email message and write a new one, you end up with something looking like that. So it's um, it's dropbox.com, long random string of letters, and then the file name with a question mark DL equals zero on the end of it. Um, that random string of letters and numbers diff changes for every single file, so it doesn't give them a way of finding other files in your in Dropbox folders by giving them one of them. Um, so that's the simple way of sharing files with Dropbox. There is a more complicated way. You can actually set up folders in your Dropbox which are shared with other Dropbox users automatically. And then any files that go into that folder automatically go to other people's Dropboxes and their computers. And anything they change automatically comes back to your folder. So that's a way of doing collaborative sharing with other people for projects or something like that. Um, and the big thing to watch out for there is if you are ever on a internet connection that charges you by data or has limited capacity, because I was using that feature to share a folder with somebody else who put a very large file in that folder and completely used up my monthly allocation on my iPhone. <laughs> and then some, and it cost me $100 in data charges just because they'd uploaded a file into their Dropbox. <laughs> and it happened to be synced to mine. So you just need to be wary of that if you are potentially being charged for your internet data too much of it. <clears throat> um, and that one I th think you do that, yeah you can, you can actually choose share and you can specify whether or not they can edit it and if they can edit it then they can actually modify files in it. I, don't, I haven't, haven't gone and had a close look at how you set up syncing in recent versions to Dropbox client but it's probably tied in through that. As I said I don't, I don't want to go into too much detail, I just want to give you a general idea of what's available um, rather than um, how to do things at the moment. So Google Drive, I believe, has exactly the same features. I know, for example, that schools are heavily using Google Drive as a method of sharing documents between teachers and students. They publish documents on Google Drive. The kids got access to particular parts of it. If it's a, co a course material, they have really only access to it. The kids put documents on Google Drive and the teacher has access to those folders. It's all managed through the school. Um, that sort of thing is certainly possible. So you can do the same thing yourself using Google Drive with other people to share documents with them and probably do collaborative sharing in the same way. And iCloud Drive probably can, I just haven't gone looking into exactly how you do it. So any others that people know of that's worth mentioning? Nope? Just a, just a footnote too. Um, just recently our work now is using Dropbox. We have a Dropbox account which we use at work. Uh, basically it allows me to use PDF Reader Oh, so it's basically a shared, it's a shared data storage yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a shared data storage. Yeah. You can set it up with an account name and password. Yeah. Each region has a different password we enter in, or different logins. Yep. Um, and we can go in there, and they update it all the time. So all our mobile phones, our computers, our smartphones, our servers, yep. and insurance, and stuff, they all have their own little um, Dropbox account. And it's all shared in one place. So it's easy to manage the different files that are there. Yeah. So you're not having to go into the Google Drive and manage every file that's there. Yeah. It's all shared in one place. Yeah. 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 Ye
Now, as I've mentioned before with Dropbox as an example that it syncs everything in your Dropbox folder. You can actually customise that. You can say, I don't want certain folders to appear on this computer, so you can actually turn off bits of it, but you can still access them through the web interface. And it also has the ability to pick arbitrary folders elsewhere on your computer and also sync those folders via Dropbox, so you don't have to have them all in that one place. I, don't, I haven't bothered using those features, but they're available as well. Sharing photos and videos. How many ways are there? Instagram, um, what's the Facebook. Flickr, Facebook, um, I'm sure Facebook has also got ways of sharing other stuff as well, but um, yes. not one I use, sorry, WhatsApp, oh yeah well there's many, 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 many ways of doing this, um, Dropbox, um, iCloud photo sharing, um, YouTube, I've run out of space, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> pick your, pick your favourite service, but with, with most of them the idea is you upload something using a web browser, or they may have apps that you can run on your devices which have provide an easy way of uploading things, usually if you have an iPhone or something like that or an iPad, they have an app that you can install which you can use the share thing directly from your photo library or, or just taking, taking the photo and say share this and upload it to whichever service you use. Um, Add probably Snapchat to that. That's subtly different, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, Apple mess oh, that's messages as well. I was looking for the name messages. Yeah. Yes, it's um, Dropbox, etc. iCloud photo sharing. Um, I'll just mix these up, Flickr, Facebook, not, there's not enough space for them all on one slide, so I'm just going to squash them a bit, um, YouTube, I'll need to mention because that's an important one, um, so there's Vimeo, there's another video sharing plate, sorry Vimeo, not video, Vimeo, those are sort of the major ones I'm aware of, but there's, there's zillions of ways of doing it, basically pick the one you like and, and, and if you don't like it, try another one, <laughs> some of them, um, probably Google should sit somewhere in there as well, of course, so um, Google is another one that I know can do it. Um, some of them, they actually have the goal of learning information about you, so um, it's worth keeping that in mind. Google, for example, will want to gather details about what you like and then use that to target advertising at you. So if you share your photos through Google and you have lots of photos of cats, you'll suddenly find you start getting advertising about cats because they're recognising the cats in the photos. <laughs> so I don't want to tell Google that little detail about me. <laughs> yeah, they all do it pretty much. YouTube is owned by Google, so they'll do the same thing. Um, collaborative editing. Um, worth mentioning applications, pages, numbers, Keynote, um, Microsoft Office. Um, Dropbox. Yeah, Dropbox is worth, uh, it's an important one. iCloud Drive, etc. So, if you're going to be doing collaborative editing, it helps to know what you're doing it in. If you're doing something like collectively working on a document, if everybody's running the same application, say Pages as an example, you can save a Pages document on your iCloud Drive and you can share that document with other people and you can then all edit the document and it actually keeps track of who's changed what and it's got changing online changing mechanisms. Office offers exactly the same feature via the um, OneDrive and I'm it may offer it in other ways as well. I know you can have tr track changes turned on and share the files with other people in other ways but it works best if it's all online. Um, Dropbox, as I mentioned, has the ability for anybody to modify a file in a shared folder and you can revert to older versions of it and that sort of thing. Um, it's also worth mentioning various version control systems um, like um, GitHub, which you can use for a more controlled versioning system. The idea is with those sorts of services you can have files on your computer and you're explicitly synchronising it with a shared repository and every change is explicitly tracked and it can have comments for where, who made particular changes, you can go back to older versions, you can have people branching off different versions and people can go down this branch and, and modify it in one way and people can go down another branch and modify it a different way and you can merge the changes later on, that sort of thing. That's heavily used by people writing source code for programs, that sort of thing, but it can be used for other document types as well. 
It works best for plain text, though, not so much for Word documents and that sort of thing. Um, so lots and lots of options there. Yes, pages, numbers, and keynote have all got web versions on iCloud. If I go back to the iCloud um, front end, you'll see pages, numbers, and keynote listed there. So there's actually a slightly simplified version of those applications. You can, you can run, well, there is, yes, they can be accessed from Windows. As long as you're a compatible web browser, you can just go and, and edit direct them directly online. Those generally are not quite as capable as the ones on the computer, but they're pretty good. Similarly, if you have an Office 365 account, there is an online version of Word and Excel and PowerPoint, which you can use to access your online documents and edit them without having the application installed. Um, and in fact, Office offers a cheaper subscription. There's an Office personal, I think, or there's one, a very low-end version of it, which doesn't give you the applications to run your computer, but it does give you the online versions only, so that gives you a limited version of it. And as we're running out of time, file storage. How many ways have we got for file storage? Um, <sighs> all of the previously mentioned options, just for general storage of files, as long as you're not going to exceed the storage capacity. Um, so all the ones we've mentioned before about syncing and sharing, you can just use the file storage. Um, Backblaze is one that I've been using recently. If you've downloaded archive copies of Capital Apple, we've currently got, I've stuck them all on Backblaze. They give you 10 gigabytes for free, um, which is quite handy. Um, and you can pay for more and it's not too expensive. Um, Amazon offers a variety of different sorts of file storage systems. They've got one called Amazon S3, which is intended for sort of online rapid access to things, and one called Amazon Glacier, which is intended for frequently written but infrequently read stuff, which costs less but may cost quite a bit to download things, so it could be used, for example, as a backup storage mechanism. Backblaze is mainly intended for use as backups um, and for, for sort of write, write once and leave alone type stuff. Um, but these ones, they're generally cheaper on a volume basis than things like Dropbox. If you want to store a lot of stuff online, something like Backblaze is a good option for that sort of thing because it will cost less per gigabyte than the others do. Um, one of the services I recently found, where's the one? There it is. Uh, come back, come back. Amazon Glacier. I was having a look at briefly. Um, well, that was the Wikipedia page. Found a, oh, that was the help for a backup thing. Um, found one called Wasabi, which is based in Japan, and it's one of the cheapest options. So to give you an idea, this is one of the cheapest options for large-scale online storage. It costs a, 40, a 0.4 of a US cent per gigabyte per month. So if you're storing, say, a terabyte, that's going to cost you a 1,000 times that per month. But if you're storing um, only a little bit of data, it's not going to cost you very much, and they give you a certain amount for free. Um, and it, that, that particular service is about in the order of a tenth of the cost of Amazon S3, just to give you a comparison um, with that. Um, so, well, there's some big numbers. If you're storing a lot of data, they want to charge you at corporate rates, of course, but if you're only storing a terabyte, um, go back to previous, it'll only cost you $40, $48 a year to store a terabyte of data. And if you compare that to the cost of a hard drive, you're basically paying half the cost of a hard drive per annum to not have to muck around with the physical hard drive as they're stored online for you. So it's worth possibly considering at that sort of price range. It's getting, of course, that's US dollars, so don't forget to factor in increasing that to whatever it is to, for New Zealand dollars. And don't forget, in some cases, you may start getting charged GST as well. So that may add another 15% on top of that. So just keep that in mind if you're looking at any of these pricing systems. Um, so that's potentially worthwhile if you want to have like an emergency online archive. And of course, these all scale. So if you want to, say, have 100, 100 gigabytes of your most important files stored, stored somewhere online, it's a potentially useful backup method for the, the, this sort of thing. Um, but storing the entire contents of your computer, including the operating system and all the applications, is probably not cost effective because you're wasting money just for the bits that you can reinstall. So it's probably not worth doing entire computer backups. And that segues nicely into my last item, online backups. Unfortunately, one of the good options that went away, there, are, there is a program which I'm interested in looking at, which I haven't had time to play with yet, called 
ARQ, where's it hiding? Um, or ARC, uh, it doesn't look like I've got the main page there. What's that one? That's Amazon, no. So um, where's the front end ARC backup? I want to go back to the main site. There we go. That's the one. ARQ, which is software you can buy as a one-off purchase per, per computer that you want to back up, and it supports a, whole, a huge range of online services. Um, so you basically buy it once for about 50 US dollars, and then you can use it to back up selected or all parts or all of your computer online to whichever service you want to use. Um, it's one of the better recommended Mac-specific backup programs um, that I've seen mention of. I just haven't tried it myself yet, so I'm not sure exactly how it behaves. Um, and they've got a convenient list there showing typical pricing structures. So that, that saves me having to go and research it myself. So it tells you how much each of the services cost. So if you want to back up up to 15 gigabytes, for example, you can do it on Google Drive for free. Um, if you want a terabyte with one drive, it'll cost you in the order of 70 US dollars per year, but that gives you Office 365 as well, so that gives you all of the Microsoft Word documents. So if you actually want up to a terabyte of storage and you want Office, that's a worthwhile option. Um, Backblaze B2, which is a service that I'm using to share older shares of Capital Apple, is half a US cent per gigabyte per month. Wasabi is a little bit cheaper. Amazon S3 is a fair amount more expensive at infrequent access storage class. That may be out of date, actually. I'm not sure if that's current. Amazon Drive is yet another option. OneDrive, that's the Microsoft One Wasabi Dropbox. Yeah, so they give you some ideas of, of sort of speed comparisons and how good they are. Of course, if you're thinking about large-scale online storage, there is a critical detail you need to consider. Your internet connection. <laughs> Uploading stuff to the internet it tends to be very slow, unless you have forked out for a fast cable or fast fibre connection. Because by default, internet, service, internet broadband connections are biased in favour of downloads. You can get stuff fast, you can't send stuff fast, unless you're paying more for the higher-end plans. So if you're intending to store a lot of stuff online, you'll probably want to consider upgrading your internet connection to something faster. So keep that in mind. Fibre is generally better. We're nearly, I'm nearly finished. Yep, so if you start bringing things in now, that'll be good. So we've basically got one minute to go, and then we'll be, we'll be down unless there's any questions. Okay. So I want to basically do that flying thing. I'm going to summarise all that and just turn it into a PDF listing everything for you, including links to all these services, because I just named them all. Just so rather than everybody having to write things down. Um, and if anybody has any further ones they think of after the fact, if you let me know within the next day or two, because I'm going to be too busy with other things to do it until Thursday at least. <laughs> so after that, I'll make this available as a PDF via our website and send that out as a link to members to download, so you can just download the presentation and see the details. And our YouTube thing, and I also haven't done last month's one yet, so once I get the time to do that, as long as I've got this one ready on the recorded version, we'll have a link to the video of tonight's presentation the video of last month's presentation and the PDF of tonight's presentation. So that should all be available soon. Any last requests? Have a good Christmas, everybody. <laughs> and we'll see you in the new year. Um, just